Well, here's another episode of Tom Kennedy Science, and I'm Dr. Tom Kennedy. Now today, I'm going to talk about something that has become, unfortunately, controversial. And you know, we don't all agree about GMOs, on whether they're safe, whether we should use them, whether we're playing with nature, and as you follow Jeff Goldblum's character in Jurassic Park, nature finds a way. Don't mess with Mother Nature, because the more you tinker with it, it has bad consequences. <laughs> Humans have been doing a lot of tinkering with nature for a very long time, let me tell you. But what I'm going to do here is have a series of lectures on GMOs. And the first one is, we're going to talk about what exactly it means to be a GMO. And then part two is going to be about the benefits of GMOs and some of the applications we can use for that to kind of shed some light on why they're actually useful. And then the last part of my series will be on the propaganda against GMOs. And unfortunately, that propaganda is similar that we see whenever people don't like science, whether it's climate change or anti-evolution or even smoking in tobacco or DDT. There's like this toolbox of, of uh, ways that people can attack science. But my goal here today is to kind of like, if you're on the fence about GMOs, maybe I can bring you over to the side that they're not as bad as you think they are. And in fact, they're actually good. They've done good. They've helped people out. And they're part of the solution to our problems that we face as a society. And, you know, I, I love this quote by Neil deGrasse Tyson. He goes, you know, we've been creating and modifying the biology of the world to serve our needs. And I don't have a problem with it because we've been doing it for thousands of years. So chill out. I don't know that I would say chill out, but I think that a lot of our fear against GMOs comes from a lack of understanding about, well, exactly what they are and why they're possible and what we can actually do with them. And unfortunately, you know, to quote Yoda, fear leads to hate, hate leads to suffering. And people suffer because they fear GMOs. If I can just shed a little bit of light on this and sway just a few of you, I'll be happy. Now, unfortunately, uh, the rapid rise of social media has created some problems in our society. And one of those problems is that it's brought French beliefs to the forefront. What was once believed by very few people, those beliefs are now getting out there and propagated. They're being blown away out of proportion. And then we have sites, uh, our social media sites, well, they have these algorithms to promote stuff that gets more and more views, right? So they're trying to get your attention, whether the information is right or wrong. And a lot of times, the, the best information that gets the most views is not something that's scientifically factual or even all that understanding or important, but things that elicit a strong response. So here are some reputable websites that you can go to uh, to understand about GMOs and science in general. There's the Genetic Literacy Project. That's a great one. The Skeptic's Guide. You know, those are guys are really good. I love the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. Quack Watch. That's another good one. And then, of course, there's the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry. And their goal was to use science to debunk pseudoscience and false beliefs. But also, we can use science to understand our world around us, right? I mean, science is how we understand and the point here is to understand something, we need to use science. And that is the same case for understanding GMOs and why they're useful and part of the solution. They're not part of the problem. The way we can do that is, of course, by using science. But when we start talking about GMOs, they bring up very strong emotions, both good and bad, because these have become a charged subject, right? They're in some ways, to use the modern, whatever generation it is, it's a trigger word, right? But let me ask you some basic questions. Do you like fish? Would you eat a cold water fish? This is a uh, Rio Grande cutthroat trout. They like cold water. Salmon is one of my favorite fish. Oh, absolutely. Would you eat an organic strawberry? 
I actually need to change that to would you eat a strawberry? I don't really care if my food is organic or inorganic. I don't really care if my food is organically grown or conventionally grown. I go for the cheaper option because, well, I'll talk about that later. I don't go out of my way to ever buy organic food. But here's the point. Would you eat a strawberry? Would you eat a cold water fish? Well, if you're like me, strawberries and fish are awesome. They're two of my favorite foods. Now, you know, one of the problems with strawberries is they don't like frost. They die. So if you go out and you plant your strawberry fields, hey, that sounds like a pretty cool song. I think it's been done. The Beatles, 1960s. Strawberry fields, right? But the problem with strawberries is that you want to grow as many as you can throughout the year, so you plant them early. But if they get frost on, but if they get frost on them, they die. So one way you could extend the growing season or protect them against a freak cold front that comes late in the growing season is to genetically modify them by using genes from a cold water fish spliced in there. But would you eat that? And some of you are going, no way. GMOs are not safe for consumption. How many of you say, I don't know? Then how many of you are going, yeah, you know, I'll eat GMOs. They're safe for consumption. Now, the problem is, is how you answer those questions. Would you eat a GMO or not? Might have to do with your level of knowledge about genetics and science in general. So now that I've given this really long introduction, let's talk now about what exactly it means to be a GMO. What is it? Okay, I'm going to start out with the, with the really broad definition here. We're going to go broad. Now, I know some of you are going to go, what, that, 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 that's not right? It's okay. Just bear with me. A genetically modified organism is any organism that has had its DNA artificially manipulated by us humans. That's a GMO. We have been artificially breeding plants for thousands of years. Now, how many of you like kale, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower? Those are all mustards. They come from a wild mustard plant. And over thousands of years, we have genetically modified the mustard into different types of plants that we eat. And broccoli is like incredibly good for you. So is cabbage, so is cauliflower, so is kale. Crops are not the only things people have been tinkering with for a long time. How about your family dog? That's my family dog, at least one of them. I got another one. He's a mutt. He, I, I love the guy, though. He's pretty awesome. But this is Dax. Dax, the German shepherd. Dax Shepherd. Anybody follows Armchair Expert knows that that's kind of a funny reference. But he's actually named after Curazon Dax and Jadzia Dax from Deep Space Nine. It just happens to, I didn't even know about Dax Shepard when I named him. I named him after a Star Trek character. But German Shepherds are a, are a particular breed of dog from Germany. They're recent. I mean, they were developed around the late 1800s. But he is a GMO in the classical sense. He's a genetically modified organism because he was bred for certain characteristics. So humans manipulated the breed of dogs to look and act a certain way. Now, that has come with some problems. A lot of German Shepherds, they have hip dysplasia. Now, luckily, this guy right here, he's in good shape. Now that many of you are going, that's not a GMO. Well, yeah, technically it is, because if you define it as artificially manipulating the genes, then it's a GMO. However, when most people define a GMO, that includes the direct manipulation of the genes. We're going to add, alter, or remove genes. And we do it in a lab. And that is the most accepted definition of a GMO. And actually, it's, and that direct manipulation is actually a good thing. Because it's way, way more accurate than blindly doing artificial selection or, or selective breeding that, like I said, does cause problems for plants. And it is kind of blind. You're, you're hoping that whatever trait you want is getting thrown to the next generation. So it, it is actually kind of blind in some ways. Whereas when we go into a lab, we're pretty good at finding the gene, cutting it out, putting in the new one, or 
adding in the new one and putting it in the right place so it works. So we actually do this. It's pretty cool. And then we can go beyond genetically modified organisms or genetically engineered organisms is what another term is. And we can talk about transgenic organisms. Now, a transgenic organism is an organism that has genes from another animal inserted into it or another organism. So when I talked about those uh, frost resistant or freeze resistant strawberries, they've got genes of fish in them. These are glowfish. You can actually go to the pet store and buy these. They have genes from jellyfish and corals inserted in them to make them very bright. So these were actually the first transgenic organism made to be bought as a pet. Uh, there's a transgenic salmon. It's called Aqua Bounty. And the way it was made is that, if you notice, one is way bigger than the other. All they did was basically uh, that fish, the larger one, grows all year long rather than just for a certain time of the year. And the way they do that is just by changing out a gene that affects the amount of growth hormone in the fish. So if you go to like a Chinook salmon, they grow all year long. So they took that regulatory gene for growing, took it out of a Chinook salmon, put it in the Atlantic salmon, of course it worked, and now that Aqua Bounty salmon grows all year long. And they also use the ocean pout, which is a cold water fish, to make it uh, more resistant to freezing in the winter time. So now you can have these Atlantic salmon growing all year long, even in cold temperatures. And, you know, cold water fish like salmon, these are excellent sources of protein. And of course, your unsaturated or polyunsaturated fats, which we know are good for you. And then people, you know, they want to talk about potential risk. What if it got out into the marine ecosystem? Yeah, you got a large predator out there. Um, well, through fishing, we've removed most of the large predators from the oceans. So we've already done enormous impact to the oceans. I, I'm not worried about that at all. And in fact, they don't even get them near the oceans. They're grown inland. But it is possible it could get out. But the damage we've already done is far worse. I'd rather have a good source of protein. Now, the reason why GMOs work is that, you know, all life came from common ancestry. We all evolved from an ancestor that lived about 3.8, more likely 4 billion years ago. That's why we have over 100 genes in common with every living organism on this planet. We use the same 20 amino acids. We use the same four nucleotides, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine in our DNA. And those four nucleotides form codons. That is a genetic code, which codes for amino acids. Amino acids are the building blocks of proteins, right? Those are the workhorses of our cells. So what this means is that the genetic code is nearly universal. It's the same in every living organism almost every living organism on this planet. Further, that means if I have a gene in me to make something like insulin, well, guess what? If I have a gene to make insulin, I can put that into a bacteria, even though I haven't shared a common ancestor with bacteria in 3 billion years. Guess what? It can read that gene and make insulin. And that's, that's exactly how we make insulin, right? So that's how we are able to make transgenic organisms and modify our genes because the, the genetic code is nearly universal. Now, one time I was teaching about GMOs and uh, people weren't quite exactly sure what GMOs were, but just to be clear, livestock giving growth hormones or antibiotics th to make them grow faster or to protect them from infections, that is not a GMO because they have not had um, their genes altered. Okay. Well, I, I hope you enjoyed this kind of introduction into GMOs and some of the issues surrounding GMOs. Now, stay tuned next, where I'm going to talk about some of the benefits of GMOs and what we can do with them. And then the next series will continue on with some of the anti-science that surround GMOs and around a lot of things. So until next time, this has been Tom Kennedy Science.